Earth is a strange name for this planet. Earth means land, soil, the black dirt of farms and the dryness of deserts. But 78% of the Earth is covered by water. This is not the planet Earth. This is the planet Oceana. The oceans are very much responsible for the continuation of all life everywhere. About 85% of the water on the planet is located here. Another 12% is locked into ice at the poles. Only a tiny, precious 3% is available as fresh water. There are many environments available for diving. All different, but in many ways much the same. Let's take a look at some of these, and the conditions you can expect from them. We will begin here, with the Great Mother Ocean. The oceans have the greatest variation of water conditions and movement. All conditions found in fresh water are but a smaller reflection of those found here. To understand the oceans and water conditions, we must first understand the mechanics of water movement. The most dramatic of these mechanics is the movement of the tides. Tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon upon the water of the ocean. This forms a bulge in the water. As the Earth turns and the moon orbits, this bulge moves across the face of the planet. High tides are in the areas currently affected by this bulge and directly on the other side of the Earth due to the Earth's rotation. Low tides are in the areas in which the water has literally been pulled away. As the movement of the moon and the spin of the earth are measurable and predictable, high and low tides are also predictable and are published in tidal tables for different areas of the world. Divers must be aware of tides and their accompanying tidal currents. Currents are the flow of water created by the movements of the tidal bulge across the face of the planet. When the flow is toward land, the current is referred to as a flood current. When away from land, it is an ebb current. During the time when the currents are changing direction, there is no flow. This is called the slack time. When diving in areas with large tidal changes and or powerful tidal currents, it is wise to check the published times of the flood and ebb. If not careful, a diver who enters the water during slack time may face a long swim to shore against an ebb current. Also of interest to divers are the actions of waves. Waves can be formed by seismic or other geologic activity, but the most common are those formed by wind. Waves are created by the wind moving across the water. The wave will continue to grow according to how hard and long the wind blows. It also depends on the uninterrupted distance that the wind can push against the water. This is called the fetch. High winds, blowing for extended time over a long fetch, can form truly tremendous waves. Despite the fact that the water in waves appears to move forward, it does so only slightly. It is not the water, but the energy created that is moving forward. The water is moving in a circle as energy waves pass through. This concept can be demonstrated with a length of rope. By flicking the wrist, a wave of energy is sent through the rope. The energy travels down the length and exits the end, but the rope goes nowhere. When energy is allowed to travel a certain distance, it sets up a regular wave pattern. This steady pattern creates predictable wave sets known as C. When traveling in open water, you will notice that the rise and fall of a boat has a certain rhythm. This is caused by the area's C. On occasion, wave energy will enter an area from different directions. This creates a rough, choppy surface known as confused sea. When the energy in the wave causes the crest to start moving faster than the base, the wave grows taller, and when the front of the wave gets too steep, the waves break along a surf line. This is what happens when waves approach shore. But the diver can also become aware of submerged sandbars and reefs if there is a surf line located offshore. During high winds, the crest of the wave can literally be blown off the base. The wave may also become so large 
that it will collapse under the force of gravity. In either case, you will get a broken water condition offshore, which will create what are called white caps. Waves affect only the surface waters to a relatively shallow depth. As such, they will usually affect the diver only on entries and exits. When entering from shore, the primary problem is to avoid being knocked down or buffeted by waves in the surf zone. The large volume of water falling on top of the diver can cause the loss of equipment, can knock the regulator out of the mouth, and can even injure a diver. Surf conditions will vary widely throughout the world. There is no one best way to enter. One way to enter is to walk into the water until about waist to chest deep. Then, using your buddy for assistance, put the regulator in your mouth and your fins on. When boat diving in high waves, the trick is to submerge beneath the wave effect, or surge, as quickly as possible. So plan your entrance as near to the descent point as possible. In these conditions, it is preferable to have a stable descent line. This will prevent buddies from becoming separated. Exiting with waves is, in some ways, easier than entering. For a beach exit, simply swim in through the surf zone on the surface using the movement of the water to propel you. With boat diving, your exit in heavy waves is somewhat more complicated. Your main problem will be to avoid the boat hull or dive platform striking you as you attempt to get on board. Boat exits will vary based on your captain's preference and the diving conditions. Shore divers should also be aware of localized currents when planning entries and exits. Localized currents are usually one of two types. Longshore currents are created when waves come on shore along a stretch of straight beach line. Rip currents are really the backwash of the wave action as their energy is expended on shore. As the water moves back out to sea after striking land, the current is created along lines of least resistance, such as a channel in the sand or rocks. Boat divers should also be aware of currents. The direction of the flow can easily be observed by the direction the boat moves away from the anchor. You should always begin the dive into the current or in the direction of the anchor. By diving into the current at the beginning of the dive, you can let the current carry you back to the boat at the end when you are tired. Because it is denser, cold water has a tendency to sink under warmer water, creating distinct layers of temperature separated by a layer of changing temperatures. This layer is called the thermocline and is found wherever there are two layers of different temperatures. The depth and the temperature of the water at that depth should be kept in mind when preparing for a dive. Wearing proper thermal protection for water at surface temperature does not mean you will be able to penetrate the thermocline and remain at deeper depths. The water environment, whether it is a lake or ocean, is beautiful and inspiring, but it can also be somewhat dangerous before diving in a new water environment, you should seek out advice or training from an SSI dealer. Many offer specialty courses that are designed to teach you more about local diving environments. This course is only an overview and is not designed to make you an expert in all aspects of water movement. The waters of the world hold the greatest variety and the greatest concentration of life anywhere on Earth. If it is these life forms that you have come to see, you will be surrounded by a multitude of life quite unlike any you have previously experienced. Depending on where you dive, whether Pacific kelp forests, Caribbean reefs or local lakes, these life forms can be quite different. However, the greatest concentration will always be where the food chain is the most developed. In the warmer waters of the tropical latitudes, the chain begins around the coral reef. Despite its rock-like appearance, the coral is very much alive. The hard exterior is home and protection for the animal that lives within. The coral has been slowly building its vast reefs for millions of years to create the largest structures ever built by living creatures. For a given type of coral, the oldest and largest are usually found in the deepest water. Coral colonies at this depth have had the opportunity to grow together, forming a continuous structure. 
The midwater reef, found in waters from 20 to 40 feet or 6 to 12 meters, represent a middle development stage. Individual colonies have grown together, but have not yet combined. In the waters from 15 feet or from 5 meters to the surface are the newest structures. Young individual coral colonies are found at this depth. The diver must exercise extreme care around these formations. Should you carelessly break off a delicate piece with your cylinder or fin, you have destroyed in seconds the work of perhaps dozens or hundreds of years. The hard corals are quite common, and you will enjoy your dive more if you are able to identify them. Some of the most common hard corals on the reef are elkhorn, staghorn coral, brain coral, and lettuce leaf coral. The name of this coral will become obvious if you accidentally touch it. This is fire coral, and it is covered by stingers called nematocysts. Should these come in contact with bare skin, they can sting rather severely. Be aware of and avoid fire coral. Another reason to be careful is that the skeletal structure of hard corals are very sharp and abrasive. So do not touch or swim near the coral. Remember, touching the coral will hurt it worse than it hurts you. Actually, not all corals are hard. One of the most beautiful, soft Gorgonian corals is the sea fan. These can often be seen waving in the surge in shallower waters. In deeper waters, these can get huge, some over 10 feet across. While diving on the coral reef, you are likely to encounter some of the more common inhabitants. Some of the most common and beautiful are the varieties of angelfish. The gray angel is easily identified by its color markings of gray and white, while the French angel has black and yellow markings. The small squirrel fish is found hiding underneath overhangs and in small caves. The snapper family is well represented by the yellowtail, dog, and gray snappers. One of the most numerous and common fish on the reef is the grunt. Shown here are the French and blue stripe grunt. Other fish are also quite numerous. Here we see the sergeant major. Usually found swimming in large schools are the brilliant blue chromis. The damselfish are among the most interesting fish on the reef. Although only a few centimeters long, this species will stake out a claim and defend it against anything. The spotfin and banded butterfly fish mate for life and are usually found swimming in pairs, while the parrotfish can be found feeding on the coral. This fish uses its beak to break off pieces of coral which it then grinds to get at the animal inside. The hard, ground-off exterior is left as sand. Popular food sources are the crustaceans. The spiny lobster is found hiding in the cracks and crevices of the reef. Obviously, more fish inhabit the reef than can be covered here. The study of these can be a lifelong hobby and is one of the great joys of reef diving. Keeping a list of fish or invertebrates observed is an enjoyable facet of logging your dives. What the coral reef is to the warmer waters, the kelp forest and rock beds are to the colder waters. They offer protection and the beginnings of a food chain for the creatures that inhabit these waters. Although not as colorful, colder waters harbor a more intense concentration of sea life. They also have the added excitement of marine mammals, sea lions, seals, and even whales. Kelp is a very long plant that grows from the seabed to the surface in areas along the California coast, Alaska, the islands of Japan, and the western coast of South America. Kelp forests offer a very exciting diving experience. The fish life is very abundant. Along the California coast, the most commonly seen is the bright Garibaldi. While the oceans are abundantly populated, the inland diver should not feel the least bit slighted when it comes to great dive locations. Freshwater offers many great dive experiences. Lakes, rivers, and freshwater springs all offer their own variety of aquatic life, with the food chain usually forming around floating or rooted plants. 
Let's quickly dispose of the notion of dangerous marine animals. These images make a good story, but are pure Hollywood. We will discuss some of the animals capable of inflicting harm. There are basically two ways to be injured by a marine animal, aggressively or defensively. Marine animals will respond aggressively in one of two scenarios. Either they sense they are being threatened, or they sense the object of their aggression is some form of food. Defensive injuries are inflicted by animals that normally ignore the diver unless disturbed. Such injuries are usually the result of an accident. The diver brushes against a hidden creature that stings. Care is required to prevent such injuries. Of those creatures capable of aggressive injury, by far the most famous is the shark. The shark is really a rather cautious scavenger, usually attacking defenseless or wounded fish. The shark will almost always swim away at the first sign of defense from its intended victim. It is truly rare for very experienced divers to even see a shark in non-tropical waters. In fact, divers spend a lot of time and money on special shark dives to have the chance to see a shark. Luckily, the most common sharks are also the least aggressive. These include the nurse shark and blue shark. The most aggressive and more famous sharks are relatively rare. These include the hammerhead, mako, tiger, and great white sharks. However, all sharks, although unpredictable, should be treated with respect, and extra care should be exercised when spearfishing in any area known to be inhabited by sharks. A shark will show signs of aggression long before it commences an attack. So if you ever encounter an aggressive or agitated shark, leave the water immediately. Even less deserving of its reputation is the barracuda. While the fish does have a fearsome look, it is really quite gentle. They have unnerved more than one diver by simply following them about, but they are merely curious. Barracudas are attracted to dead fish when spearfishing and to shiny metal objects. Barracuda are quite common in warmer waters, so avoid diving with shiny metal objects in vulnerable spots. The moray eel is a shy and reclusive creature. Hiding in crevices of the reef, the moray goes to great lengths to avoid confrontation. However, when it becomes trapped in a hole and forced to its limits, it is capable of biting viciously. Never tease or molest a moray, and never put your hand in a dark, blind crevice. The ray family is also common in areas that divers frequent. The large free-swimming rays like the manta and eagle rays are among the most beautiful of all sea creatures. It is a lucky diver who gets to see either one. But the bottom rays are of greater concern to the diver. The long tail of the stingray has a barbed, poisonous stinger that can inflict a serious wound. The diver should be careful when settling down onto sandy areas or when wading through sandy water as the ray buries itself under the sand with only its eyes exposed. Sculpins are found in all warmer waters and are also common along the U.S. Pacific coast. Care should be taken to avoid the sculpin, for it is a master of camouflage and can disguise itself as part of the rock. If touched, it will inject poison through its dorsal fins. Other fish to avoid include the lion or zebra fish, native to the South Pacific. These beauties also inject a painful poison through their dorsal fins. Any fish that seems utterly fearless in the water usually has a reason to be. It is a good idea never to touch anything of which you are unsure. The most dangerous of the poison fish is the stonefish, native to the South Pacific and Indian Oceans. As with the sculpin, the stonefish lies camouflaged in rocky areas on the bottom. There are many jellyfish that are capable of stinging, but only a few will be of concern to you. These stings have varying degrees of discomfort. Most inflict only minor and temporary irritation. However, a few are capable of more serious injury. The Portuguese man-of-war floats on the surface with its tentacles reaching 10 feet or 3 meters underwater. Look up while surfacing to avoid swimming into its tentacles. By far the most dangerous jellyfish is the sea wasp. Although rare, they will sometimes enter an area in large groups. It is, obviously, best to stay out of the water on such occasions. 
Although not poisonous, the spiny sea urchin can be a source of irritation to divers. The spines of the urchin are hollow, brittle, and very sharp. Should they become embedded in the skin, they will break off. The body will eventually reject or dissolve the embedded spine. Since most poisons are protein-based, first aid includes the application of hot water or a commercial sting solution. Be sure to clean the injury with water and apply antiseptic in order to avoid infection. Consult a physician for any stings that cause you great pain or discomfort. The underwater world is alive with sights, sounds, and sensations to delight the mind. Most of the life here seems to have no other purpose than to please the visitor. But you should remember that these creatures are wild animals and will protect themselves if they feel threatened. Enter this world with the awe and respect it deserves. And above all, strive to leave it in its pristine state. Do not needlessly take game or collect life forms for decoration. These creatures are far more beautiful in their natural state. Also realize that the animal attractions at most famous dive destinations have been tamed through years of work and training. Do not assume that all animals can be touched, petted, or fed as these are. Welcome to the planet Oceana. But please remember, you are the guest in this wonderful world.